everybody. This is Francesco Abruzzino with The Scoop News, and I have the pleasure of interviewing Bill Akins. He's running for the U.S. Congress seat, which is being vacated by uh, Mr. Rooney, and he is on the Republican ticket. Uh, so we're going to go ahead. I see Bill's getting ready right now, and let me change over to that screen. Hey, Bill, how are you? I'm doing great this morning. How are you? I'm doing awesome. I'm telling you what, well, I'm going to buy some time from you so I could share this on my channels. Can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself so that the people are going to feel for who you are and what you're all about? Okay, great. Uh, uh, originally, I'm from Arizona. Uh, grew up in the, uh, well, some say I never grew up, but from the, uh, the Phoenix area, actually, Mesa. And uh, when I was 17 and a half, joined the Army and a uh, year in Germany, then four years in Vietnam ended up spending a total of uh, almost 10 years in the army moved to the dallas area and and hung out around there i had a couple of uh, different businesses insurance retail and things and then uh, you know i didn't uh, realize you were in the uh, military i saw that you had a lot of support for veterans um and i was in the navy myself but uh being in vietnam and making it out of there four years were you in there deep or were you admin or well, <laughs> I wish I was a forward observer. Oh, really? And yeah, if you know what that is, you got a life expectancy of ten minutes. Yes, sir. And I did it for almost four years. I was, uh, you know, I don't want to brag, but I was good at what I did. Wow! So, and uh, uh, kudos to you. I'm sorry for interrupting. I just didn't realize that. And I, I, I always enjoy that. Just gives you even more. And I know Julio was in the mil Navy as um, I think he was right. medical. I don't know. Right. Stubie, He's flight, but, sir. Uh, sorry, that just interests me a lot. Okay. Uh, go ahead uh, next. <laughs> all right. So uh, uh, I had the insurance agency, some retail businesses, and they were all all did pretty well. And then, in, uh, oh, I guess around two, about 1999, I started into the transportation business where I set up, I worked for a brokerage and then set up my own business and uh, ended up moving that to uh, Navarre, which is up near Pensacola, and uh, did that for about four more years. And uh, and uh, 2008 hit, and uh, and I, in the meantime, I'd also bought a charter boat, so I was uh, had uh, a lot of fun things going on. So uh, 2008 hits, and uh, it gets really uh, cruddy for everybody, and uh, and then the oil spill hit, and I decided it was time to retire. Ah. So my wife and I moved here to Port Charlotte, and just fell in love with the area, and uh, so here we are. Got involved with the veterans community here. And uh, I, I think you should be familiar with the Vietnam Memorial Wall that's in Punta Gorda. Yes, sir. That was my baby. I, uh, I was uh, vice president of the Wall Corporation and director of fundraising. And, uh, man, that was, I was so proud to do that for, for all the ones that, you know, made the ultimate sacrifice. And uh, it, it was very difficult at first. I couldn't go to the D.C. wall, uh, just too emotional. And, but this one I kind of eased into. We were building it. They bring in, hang one panel at a time. So uh, uh, I got through it, and now it's uh, it's okay. Yeah, I saw that about you, and I saw that there's a tremendous amount of support that you uh, have for the veterans. Um, I just didn't realize you did time. And um, oh yeah, it, I don't think people realize how difficult it is for a veteran that's been in combat, such as yourself, to go to like the DC wall. I've been there, and it, to me, it was a tearjerker. It was very emotional. And I can't imagine, you know, I was in during Desert Storm, but I didn't really see combat. And mm -hmm. it's nothing compared. I'm not even going to compare it to what you probably saw in Vietnam, and I can't, you know. So I can't. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was, it uh, was, I'll give you kind of a, uh, see, maybe you can think about it this way. World War II, if, if a soldier spent four years in the European theater, he may have seen 30 days of combat. In Vietnam, in one year, the average uh, instrument saw 180 days. Wow. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the difference. I mean, we were really engaged, you know, up close and personal with them. And uh, uh, it was uh, a different war than we'd ever fought before. And it, it affected everyone uh, differently uh, than, you know, the previous wars. Uh, so it was. It was really emotional. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, we got the wall built and... Uh, and I go down there quite often now just to reflect. I've actually never made it there to see it, but I believe Patricia, who uh, I talked briefly about you with her on our interview, she uh -huh. told me about the wall, and you're a part in that. And so it led me to check it out. I've never actually been there, but uh, 
All right, let's go. A lot of these people, anyone that tunes in, and generally a lot of times, you know, it's what, 10 o'clock on a Saturday. This will probably get a lot right. of viewing later today. Most people are out doing right. stuff. Um, but there's a few issues that I wanted to touch on. One is, you know, I just put up two postings regarding Red Tide. I know <laughs> your uh, counterpart, possibly, Vern Buchanan, will win again. He's Sarasota North. He's just right. uh, been putting forward some initiative to try to get more funding for Red Tide and studies and that. What is your stance on that in terms of, and I, I, I know it's more your, your United States Congress member that you're going for, but it's an issue that impacts us near and dear here. And I, I know, especially Patricia, she's been tweeting like, a, like crazy. Oh, oh, absolutely. You know, and it's, uh, you know, my love for the ocean and the fishing and everything. And it's just, it's an absolute disaster. Uh, I say... You know, the sugar industry is subsidized by the federal government, our tax dollars. And if they would take all that money that they're paying the politicians, I'm sure they could find a solution. And uh, I, I've heard of several different things that they're working on. What There's a filtration system that, that somebody's come up with that may be a good idea. But, you know, the, the growers over there, they're paying the politicians, all of them, except me and Julio, I think. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, you know, and, and the other guy, Stuby, he's, he's deep into them, you know. But they're, they're the primary cause of it. So as long as the politicians are getting paid, they're going to, you know, provide a lot of lip service. But what are they going to really do? Yeah, and you're starting you know? to see more and more where the sugar industry has some uh, involvement in it. And I didn't realize how much until I read an article a couple days ago because there's a guy down in uh, Punta Gorda that's been very active uh, out there videotaping and sharing stories of, uh, you know, dead fish everywhere, turtles. I don't know if you saw any of his uh, productions, but it, Chris it's devastating. Is that Chris O'Neill? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. I know. Yeah, I know. I've, I've talked with him. Yep. Uh, so you're all, you're, you're uh, interested in pursuing some type of funding, some type of uh, way to, to clean up this problem that we seem to be having, which seems to grow worse as the decades continue on. Absolutely. And like, and like I say, you know, it, the growers are the primary cause of it. And uh, I, I think that the, 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 the growers, the state and the federal, uh, because the Corps of Engineers are the ones that's releasing the water and they have to, you know, they're they're not into uh, anything except flood control. So but I think everybody has to get together and work it out and make something happen. And it's possible because, like I say, there's the sugar is uh, if you look at the at the uh, FEC uh, uh, reports on, on everybody that's getting sugar money, it will amaze you. It will shock you how much sugar that. money. I haven't checked it. I ha I'll have to uh, that. It, it will surprise you. Everybody, and I mean everybody except for I, me and Julio, <laughs> has taken sugar money. Some of it, a lot of money, uh, over half a million, some of them. Wow. So it's, uh, it, it's something that, you know, they got to take care of. And they, it's time for playing their little... You know, cat and mouse and uh, double speak games, is, it's got to stop now. Okay, and I just want to tell some people that are listening on any of the channels out there, if you go to my Venice Scoop Facebook page, you can write down questions. I do have a laptop where I'm monitoring it, and if you have any questions you'd like me to ask Bill, f feel free to type it on there, and if, uh, if he doesn't know the answer, I'm sure he'll get it to us later. The next thing, and we'll, let's stick with environment on one more issue. All throughout Southwest Florida, we have these outflow pipes. In Venice, it's led to major pollution issues. I've, uh, for some reason, they only talk about 11 that are on our beach, and they don't talk about every, when I was paddling down the S uh, ICW the other day, I saw them almost in every yard, and some that look like more of a community ones. And I know they're down in your area, too, throughout southwest Florida. Uh, Miami's had right. a huge issue. Not your area, right. but... What are, is your stance basically the same, trying to get a resolution to clean up our waterway with a lot of this pollution, the fertilizer, the feces and everything that's being dumped into our what used to be very prestigious waters? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we've got to get, we've got to get a handle on it. It's, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not an environmental nut or, you know, global warming kind of uh, person, but there are some real issues and, and this water issue is, is a real one, and we've got to get it fixed. And I think that if we uh, put our nose to the grindstone, uh, you know, we've, we've done so many things technologically that uh, I'm sure that there's a, a cure for this that, uh, you know, probably be relatively uh, 
simple if they just concentrate on it for a while. Okay, you know, you brought it up on global warming, and I'm tossed. I don't know. I hear scientists that say it isn't, scientists that say it is. I was for pulling out of the Paris Accord because, to me, it was more of a um, – a global, the global hand coming in and dictating to us what we needed to do. We seem to be spending all the money with that accord. Um, the same regulations didn't seem like they were going to be uh, pressed upon China and India. Um, a lot of issues. So I'm, I had no problem with pulling out of that accord. But where do you stand on that? Because I know a lot of uh, a lot of liberals on here and probably some Republicans might say, well, damn, that guy's against global warming. I hate him. <laughs> what, do you, what do you have to say? Well, I actually... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad we pulled out of that because, like you say, you know, we were spending all the money. And here's what I honestly think. You know, mankind probably has a small, small footprint in this. But if you go back millions of years, you look at the cycles of heating and cooling. And, and, and I just believe that the Earth goes through these cycles and uh, we'll get through it or you know, we'll all freeze to death, you know, whatever. But I think it's something that uh, is just part of the, the natural evolution of the earth where you go through the heating and cooling periods. I just, uh, you know, like I say, I think we may have a very small uh, footprint there, but I don't think we're making the, the big difference. Uh, obviously, we need to, you know, keep clean air and that and do our best to help nature along and, you know, save the rainforest and all of that where we can. Uh, but, uh I just really believe that the natural cycle uh, of the earth is the biggest uh, cause of it. Okay. Let's hop over to an issue that I posted about earlier today where I had somebody reach out to me talking about a very good friend of hers that's addicted to drugs and basically she doesn't know what to do. I know uh, your counterpart up here, Vern Buchanan, has been doing a lot to try to fund it and his focus has been on heroin. Down in Inglewood, uh, Northport, Venice, meth is seems to be a destructive, destroying so many lives. What is your approach? What is your philosophy? What do you do? What are some possible plans you might have to try to curb the influence that the drugs have on the um, individuals out here? Well, uh, again, this is going to be a local issue, right. uh, but, but in a global perspective, to... because it is globally, well, let's right, talk the United right. States. It is a major issue. It is a major issue. Uh, but what we need to do is make sure that that the the local uh, police sheriffs and and what have you have all of the tools at their disposal to go after these guys and vigorously prosecute them. Don't give them you know six months suspended sentence when they catch these meth dealers. Throw them in the clink, lock them up, throw the key away. That's the only thing that they understand. Because they could go out and play the system, plead down, you know, to just some misdemeanor or something, and the judges let them off. We got to get tough on the on the, the manufacturers and the distributors, and and just put them away, and and make sure that we vigorously enforce all of the laws. And I think that would would help in itself, because, you know, like I say, they go in there and, and they get to get these little uh, Mickey Mouse sentences. They don't care. You know, they'll be right back out doing it in six months. What about the individuals with the problem, the treatment issue, which seems to me to be a major issue throughout the United States where, and I know heroin, meth, this lady doesn't know how to get this friend off of it, and it's a difficult issue. We, I don't know if the resources are there. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it, it is extremely difficult. You know, I'll, I'll compare it to, to cigarette smoking. I smoked for 30 years. One of the hardest things I ever did was quit smoking and uh, – 22 years now, smoke free, but congrats. It's it's got to be the individuals have to be motivated enough to want to quit, and you know, just if they don't want to quit, they're not going to quit. Uh, so they have to be brought the right message to where they know that if they don't quit, they're going to die. It's that simple, and we got to make them want to stay, you know, a part of society, and we, we've just got to make sure that they want to get cured because if they don't want to get cured it's not going to happen and, and that's true and that's what i told the lady i said uh you know she's got to hit rock bottom and before she'll do anything and helping her isn't really going to help until she wants to get the help um how about let's jump over to something else because uh, our time is limited um sure how about china you know 
I just re- put out a posting the other day, a couple days ago, about how China, a memo was leaked where they were discussing the, how they wanted to globally dominate the United States. And they went into these different issues. And I don't know if you've seen that memo or read about it. But what are we going to do about uh, – one person asked me to ask you about the tariff war, the tariff issue with China. Uh, we got the China Sea issue. Um, the, you know, I think sometimes I think there are negative influence on the Korean resolution. What are your thoughts on all of that? Uh, well, I, let's, let's start with the tariff thing. I think they're, they're just posturing. Uh, they do not want to go into a full-scale trade war with us. And I'll give you one example. They, they claimed that they were going to put a tariff on pork. Well, that's just, that's just lip service. Do you know who Smithfield is? Yes, I've heard of them. They are the largest pork producer in the world. They're based up there in Virginia. Guess what? About last year, the Chinese bought Smithfield because they needed the pork. They're not going to tariff their own products coming in. That's right. I remember that. So it's going to be... Uh, I think they're posturing, trying to do what they think they can get away with, and uh, I, I think the president is ex- he, he's spot on. He, you got to challenge these people. That's all they know. You know, if we just sit back and lay back and roll over, roll over like we've always done, they're just going to take advantage of us. If we stand up to them, and I think they'll write, they'll they'll finally realize, okay, well, we got to be a little more fair here, and uh, I, I think it's all going to work out. Yeah. Now you go to China Sea yep, again. Uh, Wow, you know that is that could be a, a big issue, and but as long as we are the dominant economic power in the world, we've got a, a little bit of leverage on them, and I think that uh, with President Trump, with his relationship with the president of China, I think they'll get things worked out. Uh, president Trump is the kind of guy that, as you probably realize, he doesn't go let his his uh, his staff go and arrange these meetings and do all the talking. He wants to get right in the face of the principals, of the leaders of these countries, and make something happen. And he's developing relationships with them that I think, in you know, overall, is going to be really good. Yeah, there's a lot of issues, Korea and, and, and that, and they're all posturing, but they all understand one thing. Donald Trump is not a pushover like previous uh, presidents. Yeah, and you know the one thing on that tariff is I – my personal opinion is the weaponization of major media. They're making it sound like, oh, my God, what's Donald doing? He, he's going to destroy us. Our economy is going to go to hell. And I don't think they're being honest in giving out accurate information. Because like, um, like Trump said, and I'm not a huge Trump fan. I'm not a mega guy. But I do, I do like him. I do uh, like a lot of things he's doing. But they, what people don't understand is how much of how much we've been taken advantage of for years by China, by Europe, and these different countries, and what Donald is doing, what President Trump is doing, is the right thing, and they just don't get it oh. because major media won't feed them a line that's positive towards Trump. Absolutely, yeah. He, uh, you know, they have all taken advantage of us. Uh, we we wanted to be f- make sure that we stayed friends with everybody, and so we just rolled over and let them take whatever they want. Well, time for that's over. And we can still maintain good relationships with all of these countries, but it's going to be on a, a more equitable basis. You know, the, make them pay their the Europeans pay their share of, of uh, you know defense and uh, and uh, the uh, the tariffs and that. You know, quit sending the cheap uh, steel and aluminum and and things like that. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that uh, it's all going to work out. But I, I just and the and the reason it's going to work out is because President Trump. Is getting up there and being honest, and the media still not covering what they should. Uh, you know, they're just, you know, if Donald Trump cured cancer tomorrow, they'd blame him for putting <laughs> doctors to work. So uh, it's just, uh, I think it'll work out. I really do. I got a lot of faith in the man. All right. And if you're just joining, you can uh, send me a message on my Scoop, Venice Scoop page on Facebook, and we'll ask Bill that. Also, we're trying to cruise along because he has to take off at 11. For a um, oh god, I'm just having a brain fart here. Where are you going? Town hall meeting. There you go, <laughs> and that's over in Lake Placid. So um, we were talking about ma- major media. Why don't we talk about immigration because the impact there and stuff. You know the correlations. Sure. Uh, the things I want to touch on: sanctuary cities. Your thoughts, dreamers. Uh, the voting issue with the ID cards and build that wall. 
Um, all four issues, if you want to conquer all four. Okay, sure. Uh, okay, just immigration in general, uh, build that wall. We've got to secure our borders. Any country that doesn't have a, a secure, definable border, they're just open to anything. And uh, so we, we've got to do that. And I, I understand. I lived in Arizona. I know what the terrain's like down there along the border. And some of it, you, you just can't put a wall, but you can certainly put uh, electronic uh, devices to know when someone's up there. Uh, you know, try and sneak into Area 51. They, they, you don't <laughs> see them, but they see you. You know, yep. so we have the technology to do that. So, uh, uh, Dreamers, DACA, you know, I understand the kids are in a tough position. And if they really want to be Americans, they need to put down the Mexican flags, pledge allegiance to America. And if they don't want to do that, put them on the first thing smoking south. You know, if they want to be Americans, I understand. Let's be Americans. Let's, you know, they need to assimilate in and, and be Americans. You know, like, you know, when the Italians and the Irish and everyone was immigrating over to this country, they were proud to be Americans. And, and, and that's uh, a very valid point. My dad and my uncles, my grandma, everybody immigrated from Italy. And they came, right? and I'm a product of an immigrant, but they came through legally and they assimilated. Sure. They spoke Italian in the house. When they went out, they tried right. to speak English. Right. And that, that's what we've got to do. We've got to make sure that, that that's what they really want to do. If they get arrested for burning an American flag or car, starting a riot, hey, put them on the first bus heading south. We, we don't need them. So they, they're going to have to prove what they want to be uh, before I would go any further with, with the DACA kids because there's so many of them just causing trouble. Uh, again, build that fence. We, we've got to stop... Uh, uh, just stop all of the I have an, a, a cousin who is with the uh, Border Patrol and they have caught several Middle Eastern guys coming in with Venezuelan passports because that place is so corrupt down there now they're actually just going to the the Venezuelan government and they're issuing them passports. I wouldn't doubt it and, 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 and I know this to be a fact we got to stop this stuff so you know we got to crack down on it and and uh, finally, the, the Supreme Court has declared that, you know, the, uh, the travel ban was constitutional so we can crack down. And we're not saying we're not going to let them in, but we just want to vet them very carefully and stop the chain migration and, and, and all that kind of lottery. And that, that's all insane. What about the sanctuary cities? You know, you being you used to live sanctuary in Arizona. Sanctuary cities. Yeah, you probably have a lot to say about that from Arizona. Oh, actually, it's it's I don't have a whole lot to say. <laughs> I would say. Any city official or county or state official that votes to go sanctuary city should be arrested for obstruction of justice. That simple. Hard line. Well, yeah, you got to be. You know, they're, what, what they're doing is they're circumventing the federal law, and you've got to stop it. And the only way to stop it is going to get tough with these guys and lock them up. So are you, you like the mayor of San Francisco? The, are you for pulling the funding, like um, what's been proposed? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You know, they say, well, you can't do that, you can't do that. I remember back uh, years ago in Arizona when the, the federal government declared Martin Luther King Day, Arizona and, and a couple of states, they didn't want to do that. Guess what? They pulled all their highway funds, and the states finally got in line. But you can do that, and they can scream and squawk all they want. But, you know, what are you they, do? they don't have the money. The government does, and uh, they need to just shut them off. Okay, and then, if you don't want to play, play rules, play by the rules, guess what? Take your ball and go home. How about immigration on the ID card and the connection there where a lot of individuals feel like the need for ID is essential to ensure that residents and citizens of the United States are voting? Where are you on that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I saw a little uh, pop-up <laughs> on Facebook this morning, you know, for, for me to uh, purchase a firearm, I got to give them my life history. But for someone to vote, they don't need anything, which, you know, that's insane. Absolutely insane because people are, I, we know that for a fact that there are non-citizens voting and some of them, uh, especially in the Chicago, two and three times, you know, vote early, vote often. Uh, they got to get a card, an ID card, they have to have an ID card for everything else, and if they say, "Well, you know, it's it's you know, you're sub 
first thing uh, uh, voting. Well, no, because those people, you know, they, they probably have uh, EBT cards or some other kind of card like that. They have to have an ID. So make just, yeah, make an ID card for voters and just do it simple. That's all you have to do. And it'll stop a lot of the, the fraudulent voting. To me, it's common sense. I don't, I don't get the whole issue. Get, well, I get it from the left side. I understand what they're trying to achieve, but sure. I think, I think it's ridiculous. Um, we're going to hop over to uh, Second Amendment, and I see here where it says you reacted to the recent um, veto of the constitutional carry legislation by the governor of Oklahoma. I conceal carry. I got one right here in my pocket. I have guns everywhere. Um, I got pers- mine on. <laughs> <laughs> I personally feel like if the government would enforce the current laws on the books, you don't need any more. I don't think people understand that. Guns are pe- they're doing it by piecemeal, slowly taking away a little bit of right. Second Amendment rights. What's your view on it? You're absolutely right. That's why when uh, Governor Scott signed this bill to raise the uh, the, the age to, uh, to purchase even a long gun to 21, I was very very uh, upset with him, and I sent an open letter and uh, and I've talked with him since, and he knows how I feel. But you're right, a little bite at a time here, a little bite there, and they're going, ah, well, this is really, it's not much, it's not much. But, you know, 20 years from now, it's going to be a bunch. Yeah, and I think so the governor we've got to just tw- leave it I think, alone. I think governor, the governor put that 21 initiative in there and passed it because he was running for, re- not running for re-election, but running for right. Senate. Right, and, I, and it's like I told him, you know, you hurt yourself because the, the liberals are still not going to vote for you. And you, you've hurt your base. Now, a lot of people are very upset from your base because that the liberals, I don't care what he did, they're not going to vote for him. No, no. So he, he just he did nothing but hurt himself. I t- and, I mean, we still got to get him in there and get Nelson out as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's, but, a, that's uh, a whole other interview. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I was, I was very upset with that. And you're right. We have enough laws on the books. All they need to do is enforce them. Uh, I mean, there's laws against, you know, straw buying and, and, and all sorts of stuff. You know, Obama let that one guy out who straw bought, you know, hundreds of guns and uh, let him walk. we got to stop that. These guys that, that are, are are not doing what they should, uh, and when it comes to guns, that is a, a, a really uh, emotional issue. But you got to remember, it's the people behind the gun that that's causing the problem, not the gun itself. Well, you know, what was, what was the first murder weapon? Venezuela took away the guns. <laughs> sure, so Australia did. They're having a big crime spree. Yeah. But what was the first murder weapon? A knife, no? Rock. A rock. <laughs> well, gee, okay. There was a story out that some uh, some manufacturer wants to ban knives in uh, England yeah. because of so many knife killings there. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. I saw that. And it's, uh, you know, they just want to take away, total, they want to totally disarm the American people, because then it'll be easy to take us over. You know, China's and, you know, always said the biggest thing that uh, they think about when they consider, even consider going to war with the United States, is the fact that so many citizens have guns. Right. There was a I saw a pop up this morning that said uh, China has uh, uh, 250 million or, or 2.5 million standing army, uh, but uh, United States have 70 million part-time army guys that are <laughs> you know that are gun owners so you know that that's right and and back in world war ii you know yamamoto said that they were they wouldn't invade the united states because behind every blade of grass was a man with a rifle yep, so yep and and, uh, and the the other nations realize that that so many citizens carry guns and i think that's a strong right. um deterrent for a lot of these countries that even would consider, right. I mean, forget the nuclear, we got the nuclear bombs and everything else, but I'm, I'm sure you appreciate what I'm saying. Sure. Uh, absolutely. Uh, medical. Let's hop over to that from guns. To okay. Medical. Um, I'm in the medical business, been in it for 20 years and okay. I've seen what it's, what Obamacare has done to uh, individual patients and how they have to pay so much more. I've seen personally where every year my insurance goes up about a hundred dollars a month um, I used to have like a five hundred dollar deductible prior to Obamacare. Now it's like ten thousand, and right. it's killing me as it's killing many Americans. So, 
one thing, Vern Buchanan, it just cracks me up because he's out there saying, I'm going to fight these guys. I'm going to, these, I, I'm not going to take it from the swamp. And I'm like, what the hell is he talking about? That guy is the swamp. Yeah. And I hate right. to say that because he's run against Shapiro, who's got a lot of issues, but he is a swamp. He's right. done nothing. And they all, all the Republicans sat on their hands when it came yep. to redoing, redesigning, and creating a better medical system out there. Where do you stand on this issue? Uh, absolutely. I, my wife has been a registered nurse all of her adult life. So uh, I know, you know, from what she tells me that the Obamacare was just an absolute nightmare. Uh, one, one of the things that they can do is uh, let the insurance companies, you know, go across state lines. And I think that would would help lower cost with competition. But there's another another thing out there in the wind right now. Uh, Dr. Lee Gross over in uh, Northport has developed a, a program. It's called the Epiphany Program. And I think right now he has about a, a thousand doctors in it. And what it is for sixty dollars a month for an adult, you get your primary care and all your labs. You know, I saw that on your sheet, Epiphany, and I have on here to ask you what it is, and I couldn't find anything. And I know, like, uh, Brian Webb is here from Northport. He put on the page. Uh huh. Definitely hit that hard again. I, I'm interrupting you because I wanted you to repeat that because sure. I wanted to find out what it's all about. What it is, now you can't have any other insurance and, and belong to this program, but for $60 a month, you get all of your primary care and your labs. Are covered. Wow. Now, one of the things that he's fighting is that when he tries to expand it to get uh, the specialty care, you know, cardiologists, chiropractors, you know, all the other different specialty uh, doctors involved, the state has stopped him because they're saying that it's selling insurance. Well, it's not. It's selling prepaid health care. And, uh, you know, he's been up there to the state and everybody's going, oh, yeah, great, great plan, da 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 da. But then when it comes to a bill, they turn him down. And so, you know, you look at the, the 200 uh, insurance lobbyists that are roaming the halls up there. It's not hard to figure out why. So, uh, but I think we need to loosen that up and, and let the doctors come up with a great plan. You know, I've looked at it and I've talked to him and it's a great plan. If they just need to expand on it and get the government out of it. And it's called the, That's so the do you problem. just Google Epiphany Program Northport? Right. Or Dr. Lee Gross, G-R-O-S-S. And you know what's uh, a travesty is that so many lobbyists are in there. You know, we mentioned lobbyists earlier. You mentioned it, It's basically what we're seeing now. The the lobbyists are in there for the insurance companies. They don't want something like this around. Absolutely. They're making too much money. Now, who – let me ask you this because this will be a question. Who is Bill taking money from? Uh, who are some of your biggest donors out there? I haven't even checked. <laughs> Uh, well, let's see here. Uh, actually, my biggest donor is uh, an individual who uh, is a friend, a Vietnam veteran. Uh, I The only money that I've taken from out of state is my wife's aunt in Virginia sent me $100. I've taken no lobbyist money, no corporate money, no special interest money. I'm just not going to do it. Now, how do you and, think and that I, will impact you, though? Because I think Julio, if I recall right, he had some impressive money that he's been taking in. Oh, yeah, big money. But let me ask you this. What would you think of a guy that goes to New York City and does a $1,000 a plate fundraiser getting money from the same guys that give you de Blasio and Cuomo? What would you think of that? And the guy is a congressman from District 17. Who's that? Julio Gonzalez. Really? Yep. Yeah, and I hate to hear that. You know, and I, I, I know Julio. I interviewed him. When I, and started. I've got to be friends with him. Yeah. And that's one of the few things that just really turns me off, you know, going for this big outside money. Because everybody knows that the politicians, which I'm not a politician, everybody knows that they take care of their big donors. Well, who's he going to take care of? And the bill comes down between New York or, or Southwest Florida. Who's he going to take care of? That's my question. Well, and you know, along the lines of Julio too. One of the biggest issues I have with him is he's a bit of a religious zealot. Now, I'm Catholic. I was baptized Catholic, but mm -hmm. I'm not. I have issues with the Catholic Church. I'm not a religious zealot whatsoever. 
it concerns me because he seems to be a little bit too much. And if he ever wants it, I've invited him to it for an interview if he wants to, and I'll ask him on that and question him on that. What are, what are your thoughts? Because it seems like that comes into some of the bills that he uh, tried to in- introduce when he was at the state. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm not going to get into the religion. I'm a, I'm a Baptist. And I'm I'm a, a Christian, and uh, my my religious thinking does not go, you know if 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 the bill is not moral you know uh, obviously I'm I'm not going to be for it but uh, you know I, I I leave everybody's religion between themselves and God I I just try not to get involved. So you let a moral compass guide you versus a religious, right? Okay, and that, right, and that's fair. Uh, what else on medical? I know I had something else. You had that epiphany, which I thought was great. Uh, yes. Insurance company allowed to have cross lines. I thought was an excellent idea that I saw on you. Um, pre-existing condition. Why don't you touch on that? Because I know that's a concern that a lot of people have. The other one on here is you said that you should have a block grant Medicaid to the states. Why don't you elaborate on that? Okay. Uh, with with the federal government uh, being involved, uh, of course it's it's. It's just a nightmare of a bureaucracy, and obviously the the residents in Southwest Florida, they don't have the same issues as the the guys in Billings, Montana. So just give the money to the states, get the federal government out of it, and let the local people decide how it needs to be spent. Because everybody has different issues, and uh, just you know get the government out of as much as we can get them out of it of everything you know education it just if they're gonna give money for medicaid just give it to the state let the states determine but how, how you know and i appreciate that but how are you going to do it it seems like any initiative that goes counter to what's in play now is gets shut down because you do have what president trump calls the swamp so what i mean what kind of game plan do you have a game plan on how it you know, your Congressman Bill Akins, you're going up there, you're knocking down the door. Uh, one of the reasons, one person I'm glad that's going to be out of there is Paul Ryan, because I was watching a show, it was Tucker Carlson the other day, and they said, yes. Paul Ryan, they said leadership, they wouldn't mention his name, but the um, lady knew it was Paul. Right. He is the one that's blocking and hurting a lot of the initiatives on there. So, Congressman Aiken comes into D.C., what are you going to do, how are you going to get this done? Because I don't know how you can. Well, yeah. First of all, we've got to keep draining the swamp. Get more of these guys out of there that are just holding this stuff up. And that's going to be the first priority is get these guys out of there and drain the swamp. The bureaucracy is actually running the show, and we've got to get rid of all these guys and put people in there that actually care. And, and they're not in there just for looking for a big, fashy, fat, uh, cushy retirement. Uh, get people that care. And I think we start doing that, and then we start changing the reasoning for everything that gets done up there instead of for, you know, some special interest. It's for the people. Uh, I I think then we can start turning it around. Well, along with that same swap thing, how are you going to get rid of a lot of the rhetoric that's out there right now? I go to rallies in uh, Sarasota, and I'll just be up there covering it like a news guy. And people will start saying stuff, and I'll... I won't tell them my ideology, my thoughts on anything. I'll just say, well, that, isn't it this way? And, you know, just question them more because I feel like they're spitting out a bunch of garbage, propaganda. And next thing I know, I've had people on my video, live shots, call me Nazi, want to say that I should be dead, coming after me. And I think a lot of this vitriol is coming from the Mad Maxes of the world. What do you think should right. be done I, about uh, that? What is your thought about a lot of these social unrest that's um, come with Trump taking office? Well, I'll tell you, it, it is kind of scary. Uh, now, we were set up at Lashley Park in Punta Gorda for the 4th, and uh, of course had my signs up and everything, and some guy uh, uh, come walking by and said, are you pre- Republican or Democrat? I said, Republican. He starts screaming, you haters, you haters. And I'm going, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't hate anybody. And it, as he was walking away, he was just screaming. You know, the, the part of the problem is the fake news, the media has gotten, uh, uh, you know, all crazy and and they're not putting out the truth. You know, you listen to some of these guys on MSNBC and that, they're just stirring things up and they know they're stirring it up. 
you know, you got you got to start getting these guys telling the truth. And it's that's I know it's going to be hard to do. Well, and you know what's funny is uh, not funny, but before I got into the news, I would listen to the news, and I could never understand why, uh, let's say, a Republican is saying, "Oh, they're they're spending bias," you know, they're they're leftists on there. But when I got in the news and I started to find out what the true information was, I could see how they would put certain wording or word stuff a certain way, which would sway the average voter that doesn't know what the truth is. And it, it's really right. I, I've. I personally do not trust any MSM anymore um, since doing this. Oh, I, no, I, I don't. I don't. And, and it's sad. No, they, it's sad. Geez, they just twist everything, and, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. They're going to twist it. And, you know, you go back and look where uh, President Trump was given uh, Man of the Year by the NAACP and all this kind of stuff for his help with the black community. Now he's a racist. You know, it's just everything they can do to spend things – uh, to create division in the country, they're doing. And we got to stop that somehow. And I don't know what the answer is, but I'm sure that uh, given a little time, we'll figure it out. Yeah, and he's actually done a lot for the African-American community. For, oh, it's for jobs, incredible. Everything, it's amazing. Uh, what, what's really amazing is when you have someone like Milo Yiannopoulos, I can't even say his last name, he's sure. gay, he's uh, right. married to a black man, and they call him a Nazi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's Jewish, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's crazy. I know you got to take off. So one last question, and sure. you can answer. You don't have to answer. I think I know your answer from your responses. People are going to say, "Is he a Trump? Is he pro Trump or not?" What are you? Of course, I'm for Trump. You're there. You're, I'm pro Trump. Behind his initiatives, you know. Well, no, absolutely. Be 100%. You know, let me put it like this. when when he come down that escalator and that gold, all that big flare and everything, you know, I thought, you know what? This is a guy that'll actually get out there and do something, and uh, yeah, we, we knew we weren't electing a, a choir boy, and uh, that he was controversial in, in a few things. But you know what? He's getting stuff done, and he's running into a brick wall every turn that he takes. But you know, he's knocking it down one by one, and I want to get up there and help him with his agenda, because if we do that and we can get most of his stuff through, we're going to be a, a whole lot better country. But if you get the job, if you get the position, you got to make me a promise. Uh, Julio, you know, I said I interviewed him for state, and I support sure. a lot of his initiatives. But there are, I'm not going to support 100 percent if you got it. And if I think you're doing something wrong, I'm going to come out and say I don't agree with. Absolutely, Bill. that's one of the things I. But the I am not hate going it, Bill. To be... They won't talk to you, and they hate it when I do that. One <laughs> of the things that I am going to be is compared to our incumbent, I will be available to the district. I'm not going to move up there to Fairfax, Virginia. I'm going to keep my home right here. If I have to rent a little efficiency apartment up there uh, across the river, just, you know, to be there while I'm working, fine. But on weekends, when Congress is not in session, I'm going to be here in the district. And I want people to challenge me. Why do you think this? Why did you do that? And then I can tell them. And as long as everybody can stay civil, I'll, I'll talk to anybody, Democrat, Independent, Republican, uh, because I want to know what they're thinking, and I don't hate anybody. Uh, I just I want to serve the people here, not the special interest and not the Speaker of the House, but I want to serve the 17th District in Florida. Okay, if you if okay. you got a quick second, I just noticed one more question on the Facebook sure. from, from Brian Webb. He says, "What does Mr. Akins feel we need to do to turn around our deficit spending?" Oh, that's that's really is that. Is that <laughs> Can you, you're going to hit that at the town hall today? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Now, let me tell you, uh, if, if you've seen my, my website, I have six-point pledge for God and country. Where is that, where is that website? So people you can know. find that on my website, uh, BillAkinsForCongress.com. Now, one of the things is, is I absolutely will never vote to increase taxes or raise the debt ceiling. And one of the things that I will push for is, is to actually start lowering taxes, of course, and that's going to be easier to do as the economy grows, and then start paying off the debt. And uh, there's a lot of agencies in the government that need to go away, and we can save billions and billions of dollars uh, when we do that, and then we can start paying down our debt and get, you know, China owns most of it, so we need to get that taken care of. Uh, we just, there's, there's no room in my vocabulary for any kind of tax increase 
uh, or debt ceiling, it's just not going to happen under my watch. Okay, and why don't we uh, put a go ahead and wrap this up now? I don't think there's any more questions. What what kind of closing comments do you want to put out there? Well, let let me say this: uh, I'm running because I want to represent the people of uh, District 17. I have no, I don't need a job. I have no further ambitions. I believe in term limits. You know, I can probably get done what I want to do in two terms. Uh, three terms is what the uh, national term limit pledge is all about, and that I've signed that agreement. I'm not a career politician. I'm not a politician at all. You know, I'm, I'm one of you. You know, I've, I've worked and I've had failures and successes, and I've lived life. I'm not a lawyer you know, like the other guys are. I just want to do what's right, and I have to use common sense to, to guide me and, and, and moral dignity, and I think I will do a great job representing the people of the 17th District and not special interest, big sugar, uh, whatever, any defense industries. You know, they can take their, their doors, go somewhere else. I'm not going to listen to them. So representing you is what I'm all about. And that's awesome. And I want to thank you for, you know, having the time to listen to me today. you got to make a promise to come back if you win the ticket. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You can go to my website, BillAkinsForCongress.com, or you can go to my Facebook, Bill Akins for Congress, and uh, I keep the Facebook uh, page updated every day and then uh, a couple of times a week on the uh, website. And are you but looking I'm for donations everything. and volunteers at all? Oh, absolutely. If uh, You can go to my website for uh, contributions, and we have a secure website. Uh, it also has the address if you'd like to mail a check. And we are the little guy, you know, we're, we're, we're way below everybody else on money. But you know what? Julio called me the other day and said, I can't believe it, but they did a poll and we were tied. I'm telling you, it's between you and Julio. I, 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 I think Stubby's out of it. I just, I know too, I know some stuff about him. I don't think he's in it. He doesn't even oh. live in our district. <laughs> it, yeah, he doesn't even live in the district. Yeah, <laughs> right. I call him it, the yeah, I, I've heard some things about Stubby too. And I'm not going to say it, but it, it may come out, may not. But that's 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 not out. I don't have anything to do with it. That's his business. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to run my race. And Julio and I have an agreement. We will not attack each other personally. We have a great respect for each other. And we've actually become <laughs> friends. Uh, but we do have differences that I think uh, will, will make a difference in this race. And, uh, you know, God willing, I'll be there and uh, and we'll win this thing in November. Thanks a lot. I know you got to take off to your town hall, guys. He's going to be in Lake Placid later today, and you're going to try streaming it. He said he's got a meeting with some guys after this. Try to do that. At least do a Facebook Live. Yeah. And uh, we'll uh, we're going to have fun. Awesome. Well, best of luck in your campaign, and um, I'm going to I'm going to call on you to come back if you win the ticket. Absolutely. Even if I don't win, call on me. I'll, I'll always have something to say. <laughs> All right. Best of luck, Bill. Thank you so much, and have a great day. You too. God bless. All right. Okay, everybody, that was Bill Akins, and hold on one second. All right, everyone, that was Bill Akins. Um, you know what? I wanted to interview him after talking to Sandra. I think he's an excellent candidate out there. Oh, he's still on there. We shut him off. Okay, um, so, you know, he, he's a viable candidate out there for the Republican ticket. Um, the Democrats are more than encouraged i've invited them to come on here they're welcome to come on here i'll interview them and show them the same respect that i've shown bill i'd like to learn what they're all about uh julio's welcome to come on here and i've even extended an invitation to Stuby, along with all the other local um candidates this uh will be up on my website if you guys want to share it with anybody that's not on facebook i'll put it up there after i'm done on this and that's it hopefully you guys enjoyed it hopefully it was informative for you um bill does will represent venice northport inglewood Punta Gorda, port charlotte um north is uh Vern. all right everybody this has been frankie and have a great day yeah.